So, we can continue our discussion on the safety testing of medical device. Uh, the objectives of this kind of uh, testing is that uh, is that first to assess uh, whether the intended physiological function, uh, whether this device that which we fabricated. So, essentially to make this phrase complete capacity of the device to maintain intended physiological function. Now, of intended physiological function, let us take the example of THR. So, then intended physiological function would be walking or in case of very younger patients, just little bit running. So, whether this kind of physiological functions are compromised after a patient receives this uh, total hip joint replacement that needs to be assessed. Uh, second one that what is the response of the host and third one what is the response of the device itself. And fourth one is that whether this device can perform for a significant period of time. So, essentially one can do some performance device performance testing for the same uh, example that I just mentioned total hip joint replacement one can use the hip simulated experiments. Now, there one can use 10 to the power 5, 10 to the power 6 number of fatigue cycles and from there one can see whether this material can sustain without failure this such a large number of fatigue cycles and on the basis of that such performance one can further predict this material can survive in human patient may be for the time period of 15 to 20 years. But this is just a prediction, but when you are using 10 to the 5 number of cycles, you are not a, a actually experimenting the material under biomechanical fatigue conditions for such a longer time period. But instead you are doing what we call some accelerated testing in the laboratory. Now, so your predictions may succeed or your prediction can fail in actual conditions when a patient receives the same biomedical device and then they maintain certain regular activity, physiological activity and there it can so happen that the device can perform only up to in a respect in a up in an appropriate manner for up to only 10 years. However, this kind of accelerated testing of hip simulator or different joint simulator testing is helpful at least to predict what is the total number of what, what is that lifetime or what will be the longevity of a new device that has come out of a specific research program. So, I repeat the device performance testing is quite unique and they should not be confused or compromised with the simple lab scale testing of uh, lab scale testing of a coupon samples using standard array of materials characterization based techniques. So, for example, hip simulator simulates that more kind of fatigue type of uh, conditions under the physiologically uh, relevant loading conditions and then it keeps certain uh, gait cycles let us say tend to, uh, and certain fatigue cycles and there people uh, then and there on that simulator machine it can be seen that whether this material can sustain what is the maximum number of fatigue cycles and on the basis of that this longevity of a device can be predicted. These are some of the uh, some of the examples of the different kind of uh, preclinical trials one can do. For example, mechanical or heart tissue valve uh, can be tested in sheep or pig model that I have mentioned before. Uh, the drug eluting coronary stains uh, in uh, can be tested in a different animal model. Then uh, ureteric stent in pig model can be tested, orthopedic implants can be uh, tested in goat model, dog model using uh, that uh, segmental defect models, rabbit segmental defect models or typical femoral defects model. Dental materials can be used in dog or pig models. 
Okay. Now, some of the questions that one needs to one need to address while uh, designing this kind of preclinical study is that what would be the duration of testing? Then, duration of testing should be uh, should have some uh, some similarity with the likely clinical exposure time, like uh, or it has some correlation with the likely exposure time. Another way that one can also fix that uh, duration testing duration is to see that at what time point the steady state host response is reached. That means, that either fiber, fibrous encapsulation or certain uh, inflammatory cell activity is reached a steady state and that is the time frame that one should use one should use in actual preclinical study. But for degradable materials in one of the examples I have shown in the last module that one material completely goes off after, after implanting in an, in an animal model leaving just a residue of that material. So, this is the sign of a uh, large scale degradation in the physiological medium, physiological environment. Now, for those degradable materials one has to fix the time period of implantation beyond the point of complete degradation. Okay. So, this is the beyond of complete degradation. So, let us say if the degradation takes place over 12 weeks or 14 weeks. So, if this degradation takes place 12 to 14 weeks, then one should do this clinic uh, preclinical study for let us say 52 weeks or uh, 52 weeks or so on. Why such a longer time period is required? Because once you do this degrade, once you know that this material degrades in preclinical uh, in, in any animal model in 3 months, then subsequent 3 to 4 months you have to study that how this degraded, degraded product is now distributed biologically in the total body and how it causes systemic or local toxicity to the tissue in different vital organs. So, the degradation products is not stationary or is not located at any given place, but it is expected that degradation products will be biodistributed and to cause some toxic effect to the different vital organs. Now, in this context there are two type of testing and according to the ISO standards that any testing which is less than 12 weeks of testing we call it is a short term testing and this is the animals like rodents or rabbits are commonly used and to study degradation or osseointegration integration of the material or early osseointegration integration of the material. The long term testing which is typically somewhere around 52 to 78 weeks this is the time span this long term testing is done. This is conducted with <coughs> little bit larger animals, so that it has a larger time span a life span. For example, dogs, sheep, goats, rabbits, uh, ro goats, pigs and other animals. Often rodents and rabbits is may be difficult to maintain them those experimental animal for sufficiently longer time period of 50 to 8, 78 weeks. Therefore, the larger animals like dog, sheep, goat or pigs are used for long term testing as I said with relatively longer lifespan. This is a kind of a summary table like which are the animals which can be preferred for short term and long term. So, this is your short term implantation and these ones are your long term implantation. So, here you know since it's rats, guinea pigs these are all like short term cases or little bit up to it extends up to 58 weeks, but certainly this may in many times people have seen that certainly rats or mouse they cannot survive such a longer time period once the implantation uh, once you start doing this implantation experiments. And uh, this all the four animals which are mentioned towards the end of this table or towards later half like dogs, sheep, goat and then pigs they are largely used for this long term implantation. 
The second consideration, so first consideration as I said this is the consideration number 1 the test periods of the animal testing. The second consideration is that what is the number of test samples for implantation and the number of size of the implants inserted in animal depends on the size of species and anatomical locations. So, it, it also depends on the size of the experimental animals you are using. So, for example, if you use mouse or rat as your model animal, animal model, then certainly you cannot use large uh, uh, material samples or large biomedical device samples in those animals. So, you need to use the miniature size or smaller scale down size of the material device materials or device in those things. And also anatomical location whether it is a subcutaneous region like under the skin you are putting this material or you have to open the heart and you do this open heart surgery in case of the pig model and then put certain uh, artificial heart valve or certain cardiovascular patches in those things. So, it all depends on what is the anatomical location and size of the species that you are using. So, just now I mentioned subcutaneous implantation here one can see that what is the effects of various treatment or modification of materials or for chronic studies like influence of calcification. So, this is a typical example of the subcutaneous uh, implantation which can be carried out in adult mice, rat, guinea pigs or rabbits. You can see that the this is the skin is now stitched, but before that when the skin is uh, this 3, 3, 6 materials are essentially implanted in the subcutaneous region in the two sides of the dorsal sides and you can see these are like marked here. And this marked region can be radiographed after it is implanted and then it should be um, it should be radiographed or x-ray radiographs must be taken at certain regular interval to see whether there is this local region around the implantation what I am trace trying to trace it with dotted lines whether there is what can what is the extent of inflammation after the implantation that one can see in this in those x-ray radiographs. Now, intramuscular implantation that is another type of implantation and there essentially one can see what is the biological response in muscle tissues and compare between the test material implant and the control. Now, co control in case of this preclinical study one can one has to use clinically acceptable material which with, with proven biocompatible characteristics. So, any material which is either clinically used in existing scenario or which, which has uh, undisputed let me put it this word which has undisputed uh, biocompatibility property or proven biocompatibility property in vivo. So, uh, this many of this I will just give you some of the examples when people want to use that um, the efficacy of a new biodegradable polymer composition they often use polylactic polyglycolic acid as one of the control samples because this PLG a polylactic a copolymer of polylactic acid and polyglycolic acid is an FDA approved material. So, it is a US FDA approved material. So, nobody questions about the biocompatibility of that material. So, therefore, this can be used as a control material. When people use different uh, bioceramic materials then they use hydroxyapatite is another control material because hydroxyapatite is widely accepted as a most biocompatible inorganic material. So, I have given you one example from the ceramic community, I have given you one example from the polymer community just to show you that why how to select the control for your preclinical study. Third consideration is that what is the site of implantation whether it is a muscle if it is a muscle then typically 1 to 3 millimeter width or 10 millimeter length sample should be uh, used and sometimes the larger samples of 10 millimeter diameter or 3 millimeter thickness that is like a cylindrical samples 10 millimeter uh, diameter and 3 millimeter thickness also can be used uh, just to put <coughs> vertebral muscles in the rabbit and this where one can put in the rabbits is like thigh muscles or gluteal muscles in rat. Fourth point is that uh, so or oh, this is the third point I am continuing that 
uh, size of implantation in case of the bone related applications like in case of rabbits this is the kind of a standard guideline people use as as per the ISO standard like 2 millimeter diameter and 6 millimeter in length and that is typically uh, done in the femur. So, if you have a if you have a femur then one can put the hole using that microtome and this after this making this hole then you can insert this 2 millimeter diameter sample. In dogs, sheep and goat since they are little bit larger animal model, so therefore larger sample size can be used or larger sample size can be tolerated during the preclinical experiments. Just to give you an example on the numbers like in case of this dog, sheep and goat 4 millimeter diameter samples with 12 millimeter in length that means larger the size of this uh, rab uh, samples which can be implanted in rabbits those kind of implants can be put it inside this large animal model. This is just an example that in the femoral uh, this three uh, implantation sites this one, two, three. So, first these holes are created defects are created and then you you can see that some materials are being implanted. This is the x-ray radiograph of these three implants. You can see this is the two sides of the two femurs and why uh, these two femurs are showing because uh, as far as possible according to the uh, clinically approved guidelines that preclinical study involving an inexperimental animal the control implant and test implant must be inserted in three in numbers in the same animal on both sides of the on both the femurs or in other words in one femur will receive three test implants another femur of the same animal must receive three control implants. So, that one can essentially see the efficacy of the biocompatibility of the implants. So, what is the uh, fourth consideration is that what is the total number of implants that one needs to uh, take in this particular case. In case of rabbit maximum 6 implant site as I mentioned 3 for test and 3 for control. In case of dog, sheep, goat and pig since there are larger elements so they have a larger size of this bone uh, femur. So, here 12 implants can be uh, used like 6 for test and 6 for control. I think I have mentioned this point categorically and I have mentioned this in writing also whenever possible reference control and test implant should be implanted into the same animal except for toxicological evaluation. For all the OSI integration testing for all the biocompatible testing this should be done as far as possible. Okay. <coughs> the other things is that some of that uh, examples it is shown here that is for example, osteochondral defects. You can see these are small osteochondral defects and this is the defects filled with a biomaterial and this is the examples in the goat animal model. This is the examples of the rabbit animal model how these osteochondral defects uh, these are shown. This is some other example that ulna segmental defects in rabbit and here you can see this is a large porous block which is put in the ulna part of this rabbit and this is the experimental rabbit uh, which was used in this kind of experiments and this is the x-ray radiograph of the uh, implants uh, after the implantation after, after they are put into the uh, ulna. Segmental defects is one of the other things. So, there is something called critical size defects. So, segmental defects or critical size defects means so when you cut through osteotomy a large region of the relatively large region of a bone and then you insert that large uh, then you insert an implant which is of that equivalent size into the bone defect osteotomic defect in that particular place. Here it is shown that 20 millimeter length. So, that is that large defect is created segmental defect is created and then you are filling that segmental defect with a biomaterial. And this is what is being shown in the x-ray radiograph also that is the how this large segmental defect is being uh, shown. Now, typically if the def defect length is 2 to 2.5 times the diameter of the bone. So, D is your bone diameter 
and the defect size the length is done your length is created. So, if this is your bone that what I am showing this is your bone small size bone. So, in or this is that you know in x ray you can see it more clearly. So, what is the bone size what is the diameter and approximately 2 to 3 times diameter of the length of the defect if you create in that animal then that defect size can be called as a critical size defects. And this is one of the examples that has been shown in the goat model that how this in the femur of the goat this large segmental defect is been created and this is subsequently filled by this porous uh, blocks of the materials. Now, before I conclude this entire preclinical study let me just go through some 3, 4 more slides. So, apart from that general safety study, apart from this biocompatibility study, apart from this uh, overall uh, osseointegration or osteoconduction aspect which is a kind of hallmark of this uh, in vivo biocompatibility experiments. Another important idea of conducting this in vivo experiments to assess the toxicity of the finer debris particles. Just to give you some clinical relevance to this toxicity study, this slide shows you that is this uh, total integrated part of this uh, total hip joint replacement. This is your modular neck and this is your stem part which goes into femur of that human patients and on the neck is fitted to your acetabular femoral ball head and which is actually in conformal contact with the acetabular socket or acetabular cup. Now, during the walking, during running each time any regular activity with hip movement essentially involves the friction at the polymer uh, friction at the femoral head and acetabular socket interface. And because of this friction you see this kind of smaller finer debris particles. Now, these are debris particles you can see they are different in terms of both size and shape. And these debris particles first of all they can cause inflammatory mediatory response and it can attract these macrophages and giant cells foreign body giant cells which you have seen. So, foreign body giant cells are large multinucleated cells uh, which are activated towards the end phase of the fibrous capsule uh, fibrous tissue encapsulation. And through this inflammatory mediators release they can activate the osteoclast cells. You remember there are three type of cells I have mentioned in a typical bone structure osteoblast cells which are essentially bone forming cells, osteoclast cells which are essentially uh, bone uh, resorption cells and osteocyte cells this is the uh, mature bone cells or uh, this is the end member of the osteogenic lineage during the differentiation of stem cells through the bones to the bone cells. Now, if the at any given point of time is number of osteoclast cells is more or osteoclasts are more activated that means, bone will undergo resorption. So, there should be a healthy balance between the osteoblast cells and osteoclast cells. So, at any given adult matured bone there should be more proportion of osteoblast cells compared to osteoclast cells. But in case of this wear debris induced um, um, uh, biological effects that trigger that osteoclast activation. And once it triggers then what happens there is aseptic loosening effect takes place uh, at the uh, total hip joint replacement and the host tissue interface. And this actually uh, necessitates that any materials that you are proposing any new materials that you are proposing for total hip joint replacement must undergo toxicity analysis not in the bulk form but in its particulate form that means these materials must be present in a very small particulate shape and size uh, mostly in the micrometer range so that their potential toxicity in any in vivo system or any biological system in any experimental animal can be appropriately assessed. So, this is just a typical example of this uh, histopathology analysis followed by in vivo integration. I think I have mentioned these things also in the last to last two, 2 3 modules back that you have a femoral defects here 
So, this femoral defects 3 uh, implants can be put it inside a femur, then after the implantation is over you can do a series of chemical analysis and sample preparation for the histology and which involves that you have to put this uh, bones, bone samples into certain resins, then you have to cut it through um, uh, diamond saw or precision microtome, then you can take a thin section, polish it, you have to use different staining agents de depending on what kind of tissue and cells that you want to uh, identify in your histology section and subsequently it should be done by the simple optical microscope. Other things you use quite widely that is the X-ray radiography in this in vivo integration. Now, coming to the uh, or toxicity analysis of this uh, wire debris particles. So, this is a classical example of the let us say total uh, hip simulator experiments. So, you do this kind of femoral head and acetabular socket for example, you can use this ceramic femoral head and um, uh, polymeric acetabular socket. You do a large number of cycles so that large number of uh, wire debris particles of different size and shape are produced you make it, uh, you dissolve them in polyphosphate buffer saline solution or PBS solution um, so that you make that eluate of this uh, uh, particles. Then after that you put that uh, inject these particles and the intraarticular region as, a, as it has been shown here, the intraarticular region of the knee joints in the mouse model for example. And then you let the mouse survive after getting this injection. Now, after that then uh, you can sacrifice the mouse uh, after a predetermined period of implantation time for example, 2 weeks, 4 weeks, 12 weeks or so on. Then different vital organs like liver, kidney, spleen, lung, heart, their sections needs to be taken and that, uh, that should be assessed in the using the standard histology sample preparation that should be assessed um, uh, for uh, different, um, uh, uh, different uh, analysis to see that how this um, uh, uh, tissue is responded to this eluates or whether the eluates have caused any tissue level toxicity in those vital organs. Apart from this histological analysis, you one can do hematology and serum biochemical analysis so that any blood parameters is significantly changed or not. Then subsequently analysis of enzymatic activities and synovium tissue needs to be done and fourth one is a pro-inflammatory cytokine expression analysis just to quantify uh, what is the level of uh, inflammation, inflammatory response. And I have mentioned that different type of experiments can be done for 4, 8, 12 weeks in typical mouse model. So, these things are already reported uh, from our group as well as various other groups in the literature. So, I think here I end uh, for the in vivo uh, biocompatibility testing and I will start with a new module in the next, next time.